thanks for um, bearing with us, everyone. Um, so I'd like to introduce Lily Ryan uh, with her presentation, Rage Against the Ghost in the Machine. Please make her feel very welcome. Hi, I'm Lily. I'm a ghost hunter. I'm also a software and systems engineer at ThoughtWorks, and I do lots of things with code and servers. Um, and before that, I was a historian. I spent a lot of time looking at the institutionalized systems of persecution in medieval Europe, which is a topic I'm sure we're all finding highly relevant here. Um, and I'm also someone who thinks a lot about privacy. And today, I would like to draw all of that together and teach you how to be ghost hunters, okay? So in order to do that, I want to talk about ghosts. Um, historically, we'd think of ghosts as, say, spirits of the dead that come back to visit us, or sometimes to haunt us and scare us, sometimes to tell us stuff. Sometimes they have unfinished business they didn't get to when they were alive. Sometimes they're a dude with a sheet and holes cut out of you know, um, ghosts. But also in philosophy, you have the concept of the ghost in the machine, which sounds awesome. Um, it's basically this, though. The human body, which is the machine, and the human spirit, the ghost, are separate things. This grew out of a school of thought in the 17th century. Um, and the philosophy states that the mental can exist outside of the body, and the body itself can't think. And that's not really scientifically true, that the body can't influence the way the mind works. But the idea that the spirit is something that exists separate to the body has been very popular in lots of religions and popular culture pretty much ever since then. OK, so to get to the point, when we talk about the ghost in the machine, the ghost is the bit that makes you you. It's your personality, your mind, your spirit, your you-ness. It's completely separate to your body. And your body is just meat. So. If your body dies, the idea of the ghost in the machine suggests that your you-ness can survive. The other thing I want to get out of the way before we jump into the rest of the nuts and bolts of ghost hunting is the history of philosophy of the philosophy of privacy. And this is long and complicated, so I'll truncate it and be as general as I can. I'm talking here about privacy of information rather than physical privacy, although I think this line is blurring also. But the mind has historically been a private place. You can use the space in your mind to work things out for yourself, um, a space to play with concepts and ideas as you decide what you feel about them. For example, you might have thought about robbing a bank. And you've initiated that chain of thought, thought about what it would be like, thought about which getaway car you'd have and who you'd have driving it and what you'd wear. But you were never actually going to do it. You were just playing with the thought process, seeing what it would be like, trying to figure out how you feel about the whole thing. It's a hypothetical. And the thoughts that we express are what become public. Once we've played with them and decided what we feel, we can shape what comes out of our mouths and the way that we behave. And traditionally, we've had a distinction between private and public. You know, what you do at work versus what you do at home. But due to social media and a lot of other things, this has more or less been eradicated. And nowadays, it's between your outward expression and your brain. That's the last bastion. But the essence of your ghost being the, over the only private part that's left is changing. So the way we interact with information these days is eliminating the barrier between the social and the psychological. It's always been assumed that the mind was private because we never had the technology to get in there and give us insights into the inner thoughts of other people. We had to rely on them to communicate all that to us, and then we would know. And in some ways, we don't really have these insights into individuals any more than we used to, but tech companies are starting to see parts of them. And even if the conclusions they draw aren't correct. For instance, a chain of Google queries can't always tell you the difference between somebody who's planning a murder and somebody who's writing a murder mystery. And, but the thing is that there are some companies and governments that are beginning to make it their business to assume things about your inner thoughts. And they don't have necessarily the finesse to choose what's appropriate to share and what's not. 
but the data that they glean from things like strings of search queries or the metadata from your late night wiki hopping tells them a lot about the way that your mind works. Your inner thoughts are not necessarily so private anymore. So to draw all this together, these chains of thoughts and this play space in your brain, in combination with what you choose to express publicly, make up the essence of your you-ness, your ghost. But if your ghost can now be tracked and recorded at this level of detail, what else can be done with it? Historically, you could emulate a person from without. For instance, celebrity impressions, where you've got somebody's posture, somebody's gait, somebody's manner of speech. This is pretty effective, and this can convey personality. But it will never be as effective as if you can emulate a person from within and actually understand the way that they think in order to pretend to be them. And now some companies have the data to do that. So you can build ghosts with the impressions left of the mind's journeys over time. All right. Now that we know what de we're dealing with, I want to walk you through the future of ghost hunting. This will be done in three stages. Summoning, capturing, and banishing ghosts. And uh, congratulations, because you're all experts at ghost summoning. Summoning a ghost is the easiest part. We've been working on it for a while. This involves the digital recreation of your personality by a bot or another artificial machine. This is a version of your personality that exists as a result of the imprints that you leave of yourself on the Earth. In this case, the best imprint that you have is your metadata trail. I'm talking here about the information that you post online, Facebook, Twitter, etc. cetera, I see you tweeting right now, um, but also the information that you leave in your wake. Trails of clicks, Facebook likes, pages on Facebook that you didn't like, but you spent 20 seconds deciding whether or not you were going to, that kind of thing. Because these things reveal individual views and preferences, even when they weren't directly expressed or indicated. But now they're being recorded. One of the more common ghost summoning methods in this day and age is the Twitter bot, which several of you probably run your own of. Bots like this take input from a group of sources. In this case, it's taking input from the first chapter of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. And then they run it through an algorithm or two and generate new output. So these are Markov chains, as well as other machine learning algorithms that are growing over time. But right now, for summoning ghosts, this is not quite perfect. You can usually tell when it's a bot. And um, it's never going to fully emulate a human being. OK, quick detour for a history lesson. Back in the early 20th century, when people wanted to summon ghosts, they would hold a seance. So everyone would sit around a table and hold hands, and a medium, that's someone who was in touch with the spirit world, would try to summon the spirit of the person that that group wanted to interact with. A regular feature of the early 20th century seance was ectoplasm. This is from the Greek ektos, meaning outside, and plasma, meaning something formed or, or molded. And this was a substance that mediums expelled from their bodies when they were in a trance. So in this picture, the medium has ectoplasm coming out of her ear. This was supposed to be a physical manifestation of the force of the spirit of the physical world, um, something that a ghost could use to interact with physical objects. And it was proved to be a hoax pretty quickly. Um, usually, mediums would swallow long lengths of thin cloth and then bring them back up during the uh, seance. There are way more disgusting pictures that I didn't show you. Um, if you're Googling this, don't do it while you're eating. But this century-old method of summoning gives us something that I think is more relevant to how we summon modern ghosts. And this is what I call ecto-metadata. So we have the Greek ektos, meaning outside, and meta, meaning beyond, data is information. So ecto-metadata is what you get when you take the metadata that is formed throughout your life and then spin it up external to your own being. So this entity, which is a Twitter bot or a chat bot or a smart Facebook profile, then becomes a way that your ghost can interact with people in the physical world. How do we get enough data for this? The biggest generator is your smartphone. There's been a bit of discussion recently about whether or not the smartphone can be considered an extension of your mind. 
And I don't mean this in the way that people used to complain about books and writing being something that ruins memory because you can leave a record for yourself at a later date or other brain extenders and things like that. But the smartphone captures a lot more than that. Yeah, you can write stuff on it, but you can also, I mean, you can make small notes to yourself. You can make revisions to those notes. You have your GPS location, where you were when you wrote it, where you were when you took that picture, the picture you deleted, the filter that you put on that other picture to make your skin look better so you could post it online. Um, your browsing history, things you did in different chains and sequences when you're online, when you're trying to figure something out. Deleted revisions of documents that show your stream of thought when you decide you didn't want to write that sentence and then you put it back and then you change one word to another word. Your Google search history, this can be a record of your stream of consciousness. And a lot of these things add up to information that you wouldn't make public, even to intimate partners and friends. This is far more invasive and also really easy to capture. So in this way, your stream of consciousness is, in a sense, being recorded by companies and agencies through your phone and your other devices. And I'm not even getting into Fitbits recording your heart rate and the fact that you could use a simple timestamp to link changes in your heart rate to the Facebook post that you just read as an indicator of how you reacted to it. So this metadata, as well as the metadata that you explicitly choose to post publicly, which is what most of us think we're putting publicly online, in combination with increasingly sophisticated machine learning algorithms, say 50 years down the track would be an excellent way to simulate someone online. And while these things won't contain the spark of consciousness that you have in life, these ghosts will seem a lot more realistic than our current bots. They could not only post things that look and sound like you, but they can react to new events that you wouldn't know about because you'd passed away um, in a way that you most likely would have reacted to these events if you'd been alive, because they can emulate the way that you think. And this capability is only going to get smarter over time as algorithms improve, but more importantly, as the amount of data that is available about us and gets collected by governments and by companies grows and grows. All right, we've summoned our ghost. What do we do with it? So the most obvious thing is to have conversations. If you have enough data to convincingly simulate someone and predict future behavior, it becomes possible to write chatbots or create online profiles that will behave more or less like the person did in life. This way, you could eventually be Facebook friends with your great-great-great-grandmother. Or, and you, you ask her directly about that family scandal that no one's talking about. Um, or you could do this for all your friends and all your relatives and famous historical figures and complete strangers, pretty much anyone who's alive today. You could also time travel, do time travel chat roulette, pick a year and talk to a ghost from that period in time, which would be a great boon for historical research because it would give a lot more information than just reading a very dry report. And if the ghost is comprised of your own essence, you could spin one up while you were still alive and then use it to bounce thoughts off like an interactive journal that could respond and give you more ideas. And this would be technically you talking to yourself, but probably an enormous help when you're trying to produce something you could pair with yourself while you program. But we can also put ghosts to work. Using an existing personality is going to be a lot cheaper than creating a whole AI from scratch. So with this data, companies could easily take it and create all kinds of things from it. And the thing is that most companies have a legal right to use this data because you would have agreed to transfer ownership to them when you signed up, whether or not you read the small print. Throwing your life's data on top of an algorithm and feeding it a tech manual, your ghost could find employment as a customer service bot helping people to set up home internet and buy insurance for the rest of eternity. Or your ghost could become a personal assistant. We have lots of these right now. Live in your phones and your houses as Alexa, as Siri, Amy, all of these are vaguely helpful and entirely devoid of personality. Giving your ghost this job means that any of you could now become the handy personal assistant of the future. You could schedule someone's meetings, write emails, or to write emails to clients on their behalf, and 
thanks to the Internet of Things, make them a coffee when you detected their energy levels were low. If we used Fraser, he'd be the one who was asked to organize this mini-conf again in 100 years, all from beyond the grave. In fact, if you really wanted, you could have the personality of anyone alive today as your personal assistant. You may not want your great-grandmother scheduling a date for your boyfriend on your behalf, but Chris Hemsworth might be an alternative. Or you could use Chris Hemsworth as your assistant today, and Theresa May tomorrow, and John Oliver the day after, whatever you like. You could have your choice of anyone, provided that the data on them exists. And the kicker is that they probably won't get paid. You don't own this data about yourself. So if your ghost is employed in some way, and if they were entitled to a wage, which is a whole other talk in itself, the money would probably go to Facebook or Google, who legally own that data, and not to your estate or your descendants. Everything I've covered so far has been a technically legal, legitimate use of the ghost. But this doesn't cover the criminal spectrum of the afterlife. Large amounts of data are a gift not only to advertisers, but to criminals. We trust companies to protect this data. But nothing's ever infallible, as we all know pretty well. We've had so many massive data breaches in the last few years. Sony, Ashley Madison, Target, Yahoo. We're going to have more. And you don't even have to break in from the outside. La late last year, news broke that people in offshore Telstra call centers were selling off confidential customer data to anyone who would pay. This affects probably me and probably also a lot of you. And there's not much that you can do about that. The more the criminals know about you, the more convincingly they can impersonate you. I mean, this is true right now, but only get truer as we, get, as we go on. It becomes easier to steal an identity, steal financial assets from someone close to you, or commit crimes using your ghost as a disguise. It used to be that there weren't so many ways to damage somebody's reputation after their death unless documents or books came out or someone came forward. But in 50 years or probably less, your ghost could be held hostage. OK, so enough with capturing ghosts. Let's talk about how to banish them. If you think that leaving your ghost as a gift to the future is exactly what you want to do, then just as we have the option to donate our physical bodies to science, that's great. But before you jump in wholeheartedly, please listen close. Because unlike donating your body to science, which is governed by a code of ethics, there are a lot of ethical issues about the power we have to choose what happens to our ghost after we die. And there's no industry-wide code of conduct with tech that really covers this. So if you don't want your digital legacy to end up as a customer service bot for all eternity, or you're worried about malicious third parties spinning up a ghost while you're still alive and trying to use it to commit crimes or steal secrets, there are a few things that you can do to ward off evil spirits like these. One of the best exorcism methods is to restrict the amount of metadata you generate to prevent it from turning into ecto metadata. There are a number of ways you can do this. The easiest way is um, not to use the internet. <laughs> yeah, just turn it off. Um, but in absence of this being a viable option, um, how else can we get rid of them? Anonymity is one way. <laughs> Remaining anonymous when you browse online has become a lot more difficult, though. The book you bought on Amazon the other day can turn up in ads on the news articles that you read for weeks afterwards. And the reason this can happen is due to cookies, which most of you here may know, so feel free to tune out for the next few seconds while I'll explain this for anyone who is not aware. Cookies are small pieces of information that websites remember about you. Sometimes this is useful. For example, when you're online shopping, you want the cart to remember what you've put in there so that you can check out and buy it. But it can also be less useful. So advertising tracker cookies are what companies like Amazon and others will use to advertise to you across the internet. So these large ad works embed cookies in most websites. And while they're mostly used to target advertising, when data like this is stored about you, it can tell large companies with these networks, like Facebook, like Google, etc., where you've been and what you've looked at over time. And this significantly pads out the amount of metadata that exists about you even though you didn't explicitly give this out. And because gathering a state is very intimate and your afterlife should be your choice, um, if you're uncomfortable with the way your ghost could be used, or even with the way that this data is used right now, while you're alive, 
you should install a cookie blocker on your browser. There are lots of browser plugins that can do this. There's Adblock Plus, Ublock Origin, plenty of them. And you can add these to your browser and then forget about them. So these will not only kill the cookies when they find them about to load on a page, but they usually also have the side benefit of blocking ads, which is nice. So one part of our exorcism is, exorcism is complete. Another thing to be aware of is which networks you connect to. <laughs> so as we discussed earlier, your smartphone transmits a lot about you, and only a fraction of this is your Facebook posts or your Google searches. So when you connect to any network, a bundle of extra data gets generated. Connecting to Wi-Fi gives you precise location data over time, as well as information about the people you're most likely to know if you're connecting to the Wi-Fi at your friend's house, at work, etc. those things are stored. Connecting to Bluetooth can also give location data as well as information about the types of devices that you own. Fitbits, cars, headphones, all of the data that goes with that. Connecting to a mobile network gives you a constant stream of rough location data as well as information about phone calls and text messages. And now it's the law in Australia to retain all of the metadata that runs through these networks for a minimum of two years. So some companies store this for longer. And location data is not just about where you go, it can also reveal a lot about your interests. So Westfield shopping malls, for instance, are using people's Wi-Fi when you connect to plan maps of where people flow, where traffic flows through the malls, which is mostly used to plot advertising, but it can also tell them a lot about whether you visit Country Road a lot, for instance, so that they can send you more coupons. Another way to ward off more ghosts is to stop connecting to these networks wherever possible. Turn off Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and GPS when you're not using it. And when you're connecting to the internet, if you want to avoid local metadata retention or leaking information to other people who are on the same network, use a VPN. Fortunately for exorcists everywhere, we have Netflix, which means a lot of you probably use one already. Um, for those who don't or haven't heard of it, um, it's like a private tunnel which hides the action which hides the details of your actions from your internet provider and allows you to appear to pop up somewhere else, usually in another country. And this doesn't stop advertisers, so use an ad blocker, but it can stop meaningful data collection by the local government and means I can marathon parks and wreck in peace, which is nice. One of the most enduring and useful things that you can do if you care about how your ghost is treated is to get involved in the lawmaking process that touch on all those that touch on digital issues because these are the decisions that, for better or worse, are going to govern the way that this stuff gets used for years to come. Most people here are probably not lawyers. They're probably all in the law miniconf. Um, but everyone here is a technologist of some kind. And as interested parties, we can add our expertise to these processes. So if laws are coming up for debate in Parliament and they're seeking submissions from the public, submit. Encourage everyone you know to submit their thoughts. Discuss these issues openly with colleagues and with friends and encourage them to think about the control they have over their digital legacies. And if a company is using information in a way that you think isn't right, speak up about it and challenge it. One thing you can do right now if you're Australian is submit to this currently open consultation, which concerns Australia and metadata. So the Australian government is now looking at using the data that they collect through the metadata retention laws in civil cases. So this means that the very intimate data which was being collected about us in case we were terrorists uh, can now be used against us in case we want to get a divorce or in case we infringe copyright in any way. Submissions for this are open until the 27th of January 2017 and any Australian can write one as a private citizen. And I'll tweet the link to that later because I know it's quite long. But the more restrictions that we can impose on this data now mean that there'll be less to fuel our ghosts in the afterlife and less to worry about in our current lives. And finally, build ghost-proof architecture if you're building systems that collect and transmit information about people, consider where all of that is going. Collect only what you need to collect for your app or your system or your product to work. This is important, not only to respect your customers and your clients, but also to respect your own digital futures and the futures of those that you love. So hopefully, now you all have the tools to be effective ghost hunters for the 21st century. And if you want to cultivate your ghost for future generations, you might have a better understanding of how to leave a legacy that you want to leave. Thank you.
Do we have much time for questions? Not really? One or two, okay. So a note before this, um, a lot of what I'm discussing, these concepts are not new. Um, Sci-fi's spoken about it for a long time. So there's a lot of fiction out there that deals with its afterlife, but I wanna focus on the realm of reality. Because like a lot of sci-fi, this is rapidly becoming real life. And we need real life solutions and discussions. So if you have something where you wanna say, hey, have you read X or seen Y, come find me after. Because I probably wanna talk about it a whole bunch. But um, for now, I wanna hear what you folks think about your own ghosts in our very real future. So if you've got any questions, go for it. Hi, great talk. Um, so blocking cookies is nice, and of course you can use adblock and VPNs and all that stuff. And um, I don't know that you can actually um, operate a computer with all those you know, uh, various blockers. Um, the, the real problem is that it's um, an anecdote, really. Because even if you block this thing, they will track something else. And some of the stuff that you can track is actually by law in the public domain. For example, I can set up a camera, a camera on the street, and everything I, I take, um, that I'm able to videotape is legally mine. So what do you do in the long term? What do you do in the long term? Is that your question? Yes. Um, there's not much that you can do to stop it happening. A lot of what we can do that's actually going to be really effective besides blocking stuff, which you're right, it's a stopgap measure, is to get involved with lawmaking and to be vocal about things when we see that they're happening. There's not really much that can be done, which is why it's scary. Sorry. So a lot of you know historical figures you know get represented in fiction poorly because you know things the things that are attributed for example to William Shakespeare that he never said. How do you think that extends to you know to these digital ghosts? I would hate to think of the profile generated from my TV tropes browsing being representative of me as a person, for example. Likewise, <laughs> um, that's going to be tricky. That touches on another talk that I have for another time, maybe a blog post about what the copyright attribution looks like for things that these ghosts are going to write and who owns that and who owns all of the other stuff. If it's quoting you directly, maybe you could ask. But it's probably just as likely to, to have the same, same effect as misquoting Shakespeare. The longer and the